Delighted to say at uh, 12 minutes past 8 on this Friday morning, we're joined by uh, co-host of the Tommy and Hector and Loretta podcast, Hector Ahukagon. Good morning to you, Hector. Morning, lads. How are you doing? Uh, flying the thanks and uh, thanks a million for taking the call. I mean, we, there is really, g- given your clobber, there is really only one place to start. Regular viewers will be well aware of your uh, love for the main man. That is quite the jersey. Yeah, this is this is um, this is part of a. It's not only a sporting statement; it's a political statement um, <laughs> regarding the Trevor Giles Appreciation Society that I am the founding member, the chairman, the treasurer, and the secretary of. <laughs> Uh, I was on this show a couple of months ago uh, when you went around the country putting the, the the best sports people on a mountain etched into the famous Mount Rushmore. It was absolutely brilliant radio. I was only talking to it to a lad who was at the house the other day. We were going through the different counties. But I will not forget, I will not forget my decision to nominate Trevor Giles as the greatest need footballer of all time. That is why today I am rocking the 1999. Look at that for a logo. Are you, can you get in tight on that? Gorgeous. Yeah. Absolutely magnificent. So this is the fashion statement of the summer of 2021. This will be the jersey of 2021. We at the Trevor Giles Appreciation Society are now going to walk 10 kilometers from Nav and out to Trevor's mother's house where we're going to have a barbecue once a year. There's 17,452 <laughs> members already involved, and we're going to have a big uh, party at the back of Trevor's mother's house. We're going to have a, a, a Tex Mead barbecue, and we're going to just revel in the joys of the greatest footballer to ever play for Mead, Trevor Giles. Uh, I can't get my head around because the jersey is supposed to be so uh, like organic and that it can, there's almost something to the Scientology about it, Hector. I'm not sure exactly what category it falls into. <laughs> it looks like something. <laughs> it looks like it looks like something mean the merciless would wear. You see the little. <laughs> There's, there's a crystal it's Carrington true. out of Falcon Crest. That's or, true. Or look at the, look at the, look at the, a, it, it's like a runway shooting off the side. You just need but a bit of a shoulder pad. Absolute... <laughs> <laughs> isn't it a beauty? Isn't it a beauty? Ah, it is a beauty, to be fair. And uh, uh, yeah, absolute parlour. <laughs> Come here, one of your other passions, that, and we want to talk to you about sort of re-emerging from hibernation in a moment, but we better uh, ask you a bit about United as well, obviously, given events last night that, Geez, they blow so hot and cold from game to game and blow hot and cold within games, it turns out, quite a bit as well. But, I mean, they're pretty much in the final at this stage. What's your sense? We, we were having a good debrief on Arsenal earlier and, like, impossible to think there's anything too positive on the horizon for Arsenal anytime soon, but very different story for United at the minute. I mean, it was goals galore last night. I treated the lads. My, it's a great morning when the boys are back at school and uh, yesterday evening at about five o'clock, I said to them, we're going to get a bucket of chicken. So we headed into the local KFC drive through We got 32 pieces of chicken between us and we came back and we watched Man United. Uh, it was a perfect Thursday evening. Uh, wasn't a perfect a perfect start to go 1-0 up, but then to score two. But you always felt with Roma, like they're, 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 they're waddling around in mid-table or just above mid-table. They're leaking a lot of goals. Uh, I didn't expect it to be 6-2 at the end of it, but it's it's just it's very it's amazing the way Man United come good in the second half. It was a great performance. Pogba had to step up after that silly whatever he did with the hands. But I know Cavani was brilliant last night. But for me, Fred is doing so much small donkey work there in the middle of the park. But Luke Shaw for me is is vying for Player of the Year at Manchester United and probably Player of the Year in England at the moment. His his movement. His passing, his speed, his strength has really catapulted the whole team every single week since since the Premier League started uh, this season. And in all his performances, I just I think Luke Shaw has turned himself inside out. And to me, he's the best player on the pitch for Man United. Yes, Fernandez is going well. Yes, Pogba is back being happy. Marcus Rashford looks like he's sulking a little bit at the moment. Whether that foot is fully healed or whether he liked playing out on the wing on the other side he did last night, but. Luke Shaw, to me, at the moment, mm. is just the catalyst uh, for Man United's performances, which it's it's great. Look, at, we're into, we're, we've won foot in the final now, so let's hope we can I do think, the job. I think you can safely say they're, they're both feet are in it. The, the, we had Gareth Roberts from the Anfield Rap on the show last week, and he was talking about all the European Super League stuff was blowing up, and he was talking about watching Liverpool and how he wasn't sure, actually. He felt a slight disconnect watching them in a way that I think hadn't been the case previously. Do you think, have, have you felt, or do you think that all of that stuff, that that really public, overt display of greed from the owners of the clubs is going to cause a chasm between uh, fans and, and their clubs now? I don't, I think, I think from my, my part, I think the Glazer thing is always a sore point in this house. 
Uh, one of my friends, Phil from Kildare, who was working for Live Nation, running a, a venue in Manchester called the Apollo for years, when we used to go up to Manchester on a Thursday or a Friday night to get a gig in the Manchester Apollo, and then we'd head to the match on Saturday and then down the Curry Mile after it. But he was one of the founding members of FC United. FC United is probably 15 or 16 years since, they, since that happened. People said this was the ruination of Man United. People, those fans that left Man United to form FC United were, were castigated, were, were shunned, were saying they're not real Man United fans. How dare they? How dare they break away from Old Trafford and start their own football club? And to be at an FC United match back in those days, it was friendly, affordable family football. Uh, I went to an AFC Wimbledon match one Saturday afternoon. Fans from FC United were put up in the, in the local area if they couldn't get lodgings. Uh, the, the, the atmosphere around the ground in London that, that August, it was a pre-season game, was fantastic. There was comedy that night in a couple of the pubs. Uh, it was just friendly, affordable family football owned and run by the fans. And, and, and as I say, those Man United fans, people laughed at them. What are you doing breaking away from Manchester United? So it's gone full circle. It went full circle two weeks ago. Were they right to do what they did? They are still angry with the Glazers. And now the whole world is angry with the owners of their clubs. So maybe uh, what goes around comes around. And uh, the sentiment regarding the Glazers for me, I'm a member of the MUST, the Independent Supporters Trust, um, is still the same. We want the Glazers out and we want football given back to the fans. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was an earthquake to world football, club football last week, but maybe it was the little jolt and the kick up the arse that we needed. Uh, and I blame FIFA as well. And I blame, I blame anyone for letting all these biscuit tin billionaires coming in. Anyone who's a billion to spare can buy a club just for the sake of it. And that's not the way football should be. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with that over the next um, over the next little bit. Come here, the, the, we've been obviously on our uh, lockdown for the last 13 months, whatever it's been. It did, I don't know if you felt it, but certainly over the last week or two, it's felt like we are, as a nation, uh, one by one, slowly emerging from this thing, a little bit like sort of coming out from hibernation, poking the head out, having a little bit look around, a bit of a wink at the neighbour, and everybody's starting to feel, even pre the Taoiseach speech last night, I f it feels like everybody's starting to breathe a bit more now. Yeah, look, at it's a great morning when I can look out the window in Galway. The sun is shining and my two boys headed off to school for the first time in four months as a father of two teenage boys, a 15 and a six-year-old. Two Sunday nights ago, I said to the lads, right, lads, bed early. And there was no retaliation. They couldn't retaliate with, her, with anything. They had to go to bed early. So for them to go off to school today, for the sun to be shining, for us to feel like we're getting a slowly little bit back on track with a million doses or whatever uh, of the vaccination, it, it, the, the, the valve has been released uh, in so many ways. Um, hairdressers of the country, we all, I haven't had a, hair, a haircut <laughs> since October or November last year. Look, the scarecrow has just gone completely bonkers. But we are, we're, we're back, we're back in, a, in, a, in little, little ways. I mean, this week we got back training with the GAA. Um, and first of all, the most important thing for any teenager, I think teenagers, I've said this before, teenagers are lost in this second lockdown. Uh, for any teenager to get back playing sport of whatever it is, and we need to make sure that all sports are catered for here. The GAA is important. Yes, it's important in every parish, but so show jumping and table tennis and kung fu and judo and badminton and all the million other activities that teenagers do in this country. So we need to make sure that all teenagers are back playing whatever sport they're playing, because the GAA isn't the be all and end all. But to see the lads that I'm training under 17, uh, going looking for footballs at about a quarter to seven last Tuesday afternoon on the pitch in Clare Galway and to hear the interaction, to see some of them trying to kick it from 50 yards over the bar, some of them who haven't been practising in lockdown and to see it going sky high and hitting the corner flag. It was just great to hear that, the laughter, the banter and the camaraderie between a, a group of 17-year-old boys and 16-year-old lads who hadn't seen each other for months. Yeah, it's incredible really. Like, And uh, I wonder... Like, have you any thoughts about the, the long term? We we the minister for sport on with us a couple of weeks ago, and we were asking him about the decisions that get made around this stuff, and if the, they had any advisor on that group who's an expert in the field of uh, kids' mental health, and he accepted that they hadn't. And you, everybody wonders about the long term, particularly given the age of your kids, and and you know how life would have been very different for them over the last year. That sort of stuff that we took for granted. But any you know long term impact of this. Of course, there's going to be impact on on, on children and, and teenagers that 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 especially think like let's think of first years. 
Let's think of that really important bridge for a young boy or a young girl from coming from sixth class, going into a big school, going into the big school. Mm. And not only have they missed eight months of that first year, uh, they've missed the chance to form new friendships with children and teenagers from other schools. And that's what happens in first year. And the way you form those relationships is on the back of the bus representing the first year team or, or, or out in the playground playing a bit of five-a-side soccer or whatever you're doing. So all those little building blocks, and that was is what first year is when you go to a big school. You you become friends with, 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 with kids from other parishes and they're the new friends that you make. Um, and it's really important for a first year to get off to a good start and, and to and to enjoy first year because they've got a they've got that journey through secondary school. I am sure that all over the country, teachers are spotting little signs in schools where 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 lads and girls are got, have regressed completely regressed because they haven't had that banter, they haven't had the social out, uh, outlet, they haven't made those friends, they haven't made those friendships, and. They're wearing masks so i hope and all the stuff that goes with that so it's not an easy job for teachers there it's not an easy job for students to be back in a situation where it's so strange because we became accustomed to being in lockdown and that is an unbelievable thing to say that we became accustomed to the way of life that we've been living for the last 12 months in this country so we need to go slowly and i hope that there's a lot of fun now in the next six eight weeks in school or whatever it is seven weeks five weeks and that slowly but surely we get the young people of the country back on track. And one of those ways is by making sure that every every activity and sporting thing for teenagers is open and lifted and that they can go outdoors and enjoy feeling good, trying to get fit, learning new skills, but most of all, having fun with their friends because that's what sport's all about. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned there some of the lads coming back to training, Hector, the other night, uh, kicking ball 100 yards wide of the post. What about you coming back, coaching a team? Like, have you been... Like reading Alex Ferguson, have you been reading Sun Tzu in, in, in the off-season, <laughs> trying to upskill yourself as a coach? Yeah, there was a lot of look. At, there was a lot of solitary, solitary moments. There was a lot of there was a lot of pondering on where I can develop uh, my my skills. Uh, the area I'm moving into now, Owen, is that I'm, I, I want to move into the mindset of these young lads. I want to un make them understand that that. It's not. It's a, it's a it's a cohesive team thing. That if if the ball is won, if the ball is won by a hand in at the cornerback or the halfback makes a slap tackle, and that that ball is won and transitioned up the pitch, and then there's a lovely score. That the ball was won at the back by the defenders. The defenders get no glory. But I want to make sure that we all work as a team, and that that there's no one superstar on that team. And if I can get them thinking like that, also that if we go two points down or three points down, or things happen. If a forward misses a score, there's always the next chance. If a defender or a goalkeeper makes a mistake, it, it seems that it, the, the feeling lingers a little bit more on the sideline. So as a coach, and, and with the fellow coaches that I'm with, I just want people to understand that. And I want those, those lads on the pitch to understand that mistake is done, move on, next ball, next ball, and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, I wanted to bring them off. In a perfect world, I'd bring them off to Pro Patrick at five o'clock in the morning for a sunrise and sit them, get them all up on the top, and we'd have a bit of food or whatever, and we'd sit and we'd talk. I want to hear the banter from these young lads. 16, 17 is a great age. Although now they're not playing minor till under 19, they've changed all that. So in in, in theory, a 16 year old is not going to be playing minor. He's having two years running up to minor because that's the way they've changed it. But I'm into the the mental side of it. If the players are happy. And if these young lads are happy playing football, then they'll express themselves an awful lot more. And when they express themselves, Gaelic football is a beautiful art. You'd like to think then that there will be a little bit of a shift at certain age groups when it comes to Gaelic games as well, that there is a greater appreciation of that, that you're looking after young lads, young, young girls, whatever it may be, to actually improve themselves, to enjoy themselves, to be happier, rather than the, we need to go out and win the Under-16 Championship and we need to win it comprehensively. Of course, so on, like it, when you're under 12 and under 10 and under 14, fail is a big junction in any in any teenager's life in the Gaelic world. Um, but yes, winning is important. It gets a little bit more important when you're moving into Division One and, and under 17 and minor and stuff like that, and the transition to a, a, an under under 20 team or transition into a senior team. But I, I I really feel that if we can develop them as 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 as, as positive uh, uh, young young people that. When they're together, that that camaraderie, that that bond, that these are the, and they look to their right and look to their left. They're the two lads that will be in national school. There's my buddy who's in full back behind me, uh, and 
I just love hearing laughter on the pitch. I really, I love seeing them enjoy the drills, or not even drills, but the, the, the training session. And when they come up and say thanks after it, and they're still saying thanks at 16, 17, if you have manners and respect going through any part of your career, in sporting or, or, or in work or whatever, if you have manners, it gets you an awful lot of way. And, and it still is a lovely thing when a 16-year-old or 17-year-old comes up after the session and says thanks because we're all doing it for the love of the game. We're all there as volunteers, the, the thousands of people on the sideline and, 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 and coaching and helping out with teams. We're there because we love it and we think it would benefit the people in our parish, in our club. Uh, so when they say thank you, it's just, I, I, I'll, I'll climb Pro Patrick 20 times a day if, if, if I get that thank you at the end of the session and they've enjoyed it. Yeah, that's lovely. And if they're saying thank you, it obviously means that you're doing a decent job as well. You're mad about it, obviously. Are you when those lads pass out through the age grades? Are you going to keep at it, or what's uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, well, I, I was talking to one of the coaches the other day, uh, Fozzie, who's, who's, who's the manager of the team, and we were there going for us to be a successful juvenile coach and to be with this bunch since they were nine and ten years of age. We have twelve of the team that won the under sixteen championship in Galway last year. They're on the minor panel training, and they've been training on Zoom uh, for the last last uh, four months but how many of them lads will transition to the senior club at Clare Galway so it will start dwindling now as we get forward and that's what happens geographically speaking university speaking wherever the wherever or, or, or circumstances change so it's our job to try and make sure that maybe four maybe five maybe three maybe six we don't know how many will filter to the senior club and then as a juvenile coach we've done what we've done but there's uh, I think juveniles juvenile football and hurling and camogie all over the country boys and girls is in a really really positive place uh, the uptake is huge and there are so many i mean I, I saw that return to play statistics that every day every every training session in every club all over the country last year there was something like 12 million return to play forms filled out on a tuesday and a wednesday and a thursday and a friday 12 million times in the space of that training season for all juveniles no temperature no noise your son is okay your daughter's okay it just shows you that the the, the, the the power that's there that's harnessed within that in the juvenile place of the ga and sometimes we think the, the county and the all ireland is important yes it is but right back skin it all back down to the parish and to the juveniles in the club for boys and girls and that's where the heart of the ga is and i've said it before that's where i'm happiest standing on the sideline watching young lads expressing themselves and when i see them manipulating the ball off the left foot or the right foot and kicking a cool point a really good point over the sweet spot or kicking that torpedo pass 30 yards into chest and a lovely uh, a handoff and the ball's over the bar beautiful things like that and as a mead man seeing a slap tackle happen that really powerful slap and you've dismantled the forward as he's gone forward so it's all those things and i i i really love it i love i love i love training football and I was all right I played Mead under 16 I got a run on the Mead minors once but soccer was my game after that but I, I, I think it's in the blood you cannot explain the feeling when you're there uh, uh, coaching now uh, with, with, a, with a team that's that's playing good football it's, it's a lovely thing I thought you were going to say that you'd want to be sat in the dugout there up at in such a power gap at Meads and Sean Boyle and left Hector that uh you know, up at the top of Bruce Hill, there that you'd be sat in the sat in the dugout overseeing me at some point down the track. It's not. My uncle was a selector. My uncle was, was a selector. Yeah, my uncle was a selector. Tony Craven was a selector with Sean Boyle and way right. back in the early days. So he's there. It's there's a big passionate Navinamani's side of, of of all the family, and uh, they're all big big uh, Mead men, Mead Mead supporters back there. So right. I've transferred that down here. Clare Galway is a is a very large catchment area. I mean, there's seventy, there's fourteen hundred. Uh, new students in a six-year-old school, a new school in Clairvaux, and it is the new Jarlets of Connacht, where they've won Connacht Bays first year, second year, Connacht Junior titles. They were beaten in an All Ireland semi-final last year um, by St Brendan's and Killarney. So it is. It, it, they've got the best of Currafin, the best of Anna Down, the best of, of Clairvaux coming in. So you've a catchment area of about 16 national schools coming into one new school here in Clairvaux. So it's good for the, for us as a club. I think we've 800 or 900 juvenile members and I think it's officially the biggest juvenile club in Connacht and that's phenomenal numbers when you get to the car park of the club on a Tuesday and, and you see the amount of cars coming in but it's great when you look out and you see the five-year-olds and the six-year-olds and the seven-year-olds both boys and girls and that's an amazing conveyor belt and we're very lucky in a big club because I know there are smaller clubs around the country that don't have them numbers that when they put out an under 16 team they will take two of the 14 year olds and then they're struggling physically wise and size wise so it's not all big numbers in every club but there's some brilliant work being done in all the small clubs and parishes around the country 
Yeah. There's a couple of things we want to touch on before we wrap. One of them is to mention that if people want to hear more of this, just head along to the Tommy Hector and Narita podcast where they can get their weekly fill and they can now pay for their extra weekly fill on the Monday as well so head along and, and check that out I'm a, an avid listener Hector and I get uh, I get all sorts of looks when I'm out for my uh, weekly listen and uh, I'm, I'm I'm cracking myself laughing walking around I'm sure you get plenty of comments from people telling you that as well that uh, you get yeah, lots of odd looks from, from uh, odd looks from the laughs that come out and, and your own story te- storytelling capacity on it is second to none really really outstanding so oh, thanks. I just recommend. think it's good for people to smile if we capture your ear uh, wherever they're listening I, I just like the idea that somebody in Melbourne or in Vancouver or in uh, you know anywhere around the world and they're missing home at the moment and, and, and even at, at home here but if somebody puts on the headphones and has a, has a little bit of a laugh uh, and, and enjoys a few of the stories I mean sometimes I have to pinch myself I'm in a, a garden shed with Larita who's so proud and pure not more not more to the bone mm. County Mayo but to be in the shed with Tommy who I, uh, who I met as a 12-year-old when we walked into St. Pat's and we sat beside each other. And, and there you go. That's the first year we were talking about back at the start of the conversation. I forged new friends with lads from other schools in Navin. Tommy was from St. Uh, Oliver Plunkett, so I was from the Skullmer of the Brothers, different sides of the River Boyne, the Blackwater. So we came together in first year and we made that, we made that bond and that bond is still there 30, 40 years later, which is incredible, and that we're still... It's the same feeling I had in first year with Tommy and second year and third year when the level of messing and crack we had, uh, he just makes me feel very giddy like I was down the back of geography with him or history or biology. And uh, it's just... uh, It's a beautiful thing. uh, Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Laughter is good. And when you get that belly laughter where you're nearly crying, everybody needs that. We all need to feel the way we did in first year, second year. Get that laughter going, and laughter is a powerful thing. It's a regular, regular on the podcast. You have a new TV series coming out, TG Car. Yeah, I, I, for the first time in twenty years, I've been grounded. We haven't been able to travel. We cut last year's series short. So myself and Evan and Roscoe, the same team, decided to put a shout out. I put a shout out on Facebook to ask where are the people from all over the world who now call Ireland their home. So for the month of March, I was very lucky that we got out and did uh, some essential filament. And I filmed 38 different nationalities of people from all over the world, from Siberia to uh, Argentina, from uh, the Alaska to Ethiopia, from the Congo to, to, to France, everywhere uh, all over the country of people who love Ireland, who all have a different story to tell and who just gave us a little slice of, uh, of their story and how they've got here where they are and how they found love and how they found work and how they started the business. I have to tell you a quick story about the Finn Harps guy. This lad, uh, uh, he won the Under-17 World Cup with Finn Harps and or <laughs> won the Under-17 World Cup with Nigeria, mm-hmm. playing with Kanu and uh, JJ Akocha. And he was looking for a team. He went to Real Oviedo for a trial in Spain. The manager didn't work out, so he's back, back in Nigeria. He's just turned 19, won the World Cup, really good centre back so he's sending off these CVs and sending VHS videos Finn Harps responded so he flew to Ireland and he arrived at Dublin airport and wow. nobody came to meet nobody came to meet him we said it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago nobody came to meet him and he was sitting at, Finn, at the airport with one phone number and he rang the number your man goes is that you are you there yeah just hang on a second I think we've got a friend there. so a friend of mine's at the airport just hang on there so he got a cup of tea he's in a new country he doesn't even know where Finn Harps is and then all of a sudden a lad, he said, this lad came along in a pair of painting overalls and a load of paint on his hand he says how's it going are you, are you going to Finn Harps he says I'm the, I'm the chairman of the club up into the van here four hours later they brought him up to Bally Buffet and 22 years later he still play. he's still involved with Finn Harps so it's a great story and, and it's story like that that'll just make us appreciate uh, this great country that we have but where else would you get it in the world where nobody arrived to meet this under 17 african world cup winner and uh, he was thrown into the back of the of the of the painting van and they headed the bally buffet yeah no question but i really looking forward to uh, seeing that i must say on, on tg car upcoming and one thing before we let you away the i know you wanted to mention as well very special cycle on sunday for um emer murray boardsmill uh, ga club and uh, it's all taking place this sunday hector you wanted to mention that i know yeah, Emer is in a diff- you know she was playing top football last year and it's a really good uh, fundraiser that's on and she's in a difficult place at the moment but we're trying to do as best we can for her and more details are on the Emer I think I'm not sure of the page but you're going to put the page it's up, up there. It's up on screen but there. Yeah. Just, 
yeah, it's just a really good thing uh, getting behind there. And we're going to try to raise some really good funds on Sunday. So I know people can send in donations. She's a proud football player. I know she was playing the final last year. And then this uh, tragic event struck. But we're all behind her. And we want to raise as much as we can for her as well. So we're all taking a beam on our family up in Boards Mill. Brilliant. I'm going to give the details of that here now. Just one, uh, one second. Hector, you've been uh, brilliant with your time. Keep up the great work. We'll catch up with you again. Gurumila Moggy, don't forget the Trevor Giles Appreciation <laughs> Society, the greatest football player to ever play for Mead. You can contact us on Trevor Giles Appreciation Society.org.eu.county Mead. There we have you and him up on the screen there. Those sleeves are still freaking me out a bit. <laughs> Come on, Hector, take it easy. <laughs> on the Royals, on the Royals. <laughs> uh, right now to leave it on. Hector Hook, God, thanks a million for that. And a reminder, by the way, that um, fundraiser is taking place. Uh, in Meath for Emer Murray of Boardsmill it's on Sunday coming and it's a static cycle from Mizzenhead to Malinhead um, from three different locations in Meath and they're all going to do it to raise money to help the costs of Emer's treatment and last September as Hector mentioned uh, Emer played for Boardsmill in the ladies junior football championship final against Dunamore Ashburn but within a month her life was turned upside down when she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma so you can a uh, very worthy cause and you can head along you can see the details on your screen there to donate you can uh, share the page as well uh, just search GoFundMe uh, with the words cycle for Emer E-I-M-E-A-R so that's the details on that it's 8.37